The conference is now being recorded. Just a reminder, today's call is being recorded. Mr. Jonathan Weatherden, your line is now open. Please go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, I assume the mic is working. Thank you for coming, those of you that are here and those of you that are um, observing electronically. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. I hope we won't take uh, too much of your time today. Uh, we had an executive board meeting with more than 50 players uh, over the last couple of days uh, here in Chicago. As you know, during the season, it's uh, extraordinarily difficult, and but for the All-Star break, uh, impossible to get representatives of all the teams together in order to discuss what has to be done. And when you approach collective bargaining negotiations, obviously all the players have to get together. All the players just have to be in a position to discuss matters with one another, come to a, a consensus, and to go forward. Um, we spent a lot of time during the last two days discussing uh, all of the relevant issues that we expect may come up during the course of the negotiations, as well as a number of items which you might uh, consider to be more of the ordinary um, and regularized business of the association, the matters that come up whether you have um, bargaining issues or not. Um, I think you probably know, but we expect um, the negotiations to begin in terms of the first formal meeting uh, later this week. There'll be a joint press release on that, I expect, before uh, the end of the day, which will have the details in it. Um, and I would expect that, that uh, we'll meet a couple of times the following week, and then on a regular basis throughout the rest of, of July. We have not attempted to look at um, calendar uh, beyond that point. Um, Okay, um, it's a good thing I'm not a little shorter, I guess. Um, I was present, as, as some of you may remember, at the press conference that Commissioner Bettman held. I'll, I'll wait a minute or two if we need to do this. Ladies and gentlemen on the telephone, please stand by. Okay, hopefully I won't knock any of this stuff off. Um, what I started to say was that um, many of you will remember that I was present at the br brief press statement and, and press conference that Commissioner Bettman held before the first game of the finals uh, in New Jersey. And he had a number of things to say there, but I think most significant of which was that um, the league and the game have had a good couple of years, and in particular this year, with another year of record revenues, great TV ratings, and all the other things that he commented on. And he's certainly right about all of that. And I think when we approach these negotiations, the object is to get a deal done which can continue that momentum and continue it uninterrupted. And we certainly hope to do that. Um, Commissioner and I think other individuals at the NHL have previously been quoted to the effect that they would hope and expect that we would have a quick and painless negotiation. And all I can say is that from our standpoint, from all the players' standpoint, nothing would make us happier than to get to a resolution that everybody can find acceptable and to do it in as fast and is as least difficult uh, a manner as we can figure out about doing it. Um, I am often asked uh, over the course of my career about what do you think is going to happen at this meeting or what do you think is going to happen in three weeks or six weeks or what about this or that or the other thing. And I've learned something having gone through a number of these, although in another sport. And that is that I'm really bad at predictions and it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to try and do that. You go through it, you go through it day by day, you meet with the other side, you listen to what they have to say, you respond, 
You hope and expect, as I do, that they will listen to what we have to say in the same way. Um, and you try every day to try and find a way to get closer until you try and find a way to uh, make an agreement. And I can't tell you when that day is going to come. Nobody else can. All I can tell you is we're going to make every effort to find a way to do that. Um, and so the last thing I'll say before uh, questions anybody has is I want to thank two groups of people. First, uh, the association staff. Whenever you get ready for bargaining, there is a tremendous amount of background work and preparation and analysis and consideration and, and discussion that has to be done before you get to the point where you can discuss with the membership what you think uh, the issues may be, what you think is in their best interests, how you think matters should be approached, and all the rest of it. And when I say discuss with the membership, you have to do that because in the end, it is their contracts, their careers, their futures that are on the line. And far more importantly than that, um, we work for them, not the other way around. And the second group that I want to thank are the players behind me and the others that were at this meeting but unfortunately could not stay for uh, this event that we're at right now. And all of the other ones that have participated in the large number of meetings that we've had over the last year and a half and particularly over the last six months or so um, to discuss these various things and make sure that we understand what the players want and that the players are satisfied that they have the appropriate degree of input and responsibility for what goes forward. I've been representing athletes for a very long time and I am a hundred percent confident that we have a group of players on the negotiating committee and on the executive board and throughout the membership generally um, that will be a very effective group of spokesmen for the players and will help us get done what we need to get done to uh, have an agreement put to bed. So with that, if you have questions, um, I'll be get try and answer them as will anybody else up here. Let's start with a question from the audience. And if I've answered all of them, that's okay. We'll get an earlier flight. That'll be fine. <laughs> Anyone here? Don, uh, Chris Bowden from Comcast Sportsnet here in Chicago. Did you find over the course of the three days that um, uh, a lot of the guys, everyone, uh, had similar issues that they were most concerned about? Was that, uh, was that a process that had to take uh, the two and a half to three days in terms of uh, what was most important to them? Not exactly. What takes the two and a half or three days is there's a lot of stuff to go through. And it just takes a certain amount of time to do it and to do it on, an, on a comprehensive basis and to do it in a fashion that you can get the feedback, you can have the discussion, everybody can be satisfied that there's no misunderstanding and, and that you can go forward from there. Secondly, um, I never discuss the nature of internal um, deliberations, internal discussions or anything like that. I've never done that. Um, that's something that the players have a right to keep confidential if they want to, and I work for them. The second part of that, though, is whenever you have a group which is as diverse as, as these players are, they play for different teams, they've had a career of different lengths, there are some that are older, there are some that are younger, there are some that um, uh, uh, have more skill and are regular players, there are others that haven't reached that plateau yet or perhaps have past their peak and it would be silly to suggest that every single person sees every single issue in precisely the same way. Of course they don't. Um, having said that, what I think they do understand and I'm satisfied will not be a problem is that they have to talk these matters out until they reach a consensus and that they will do that. I'm not concerned about that in the slightest. Just going to have the operator provide instructions for the remote audience. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen on the phone lines, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. To withdraw your question, press the pound sign, and if you're using a speakerphone, please lift your handset before your request. That's star 1 for those on the phone. Thank you. Well, let's get going. Let's ask one more question from the audience. Bruno? Don, the other day you said that um, players wouldn't mind changes to the existing CBA. Are you willing to tell us a couple of those that are overwhelmingly, you know, unanimous, if, if there are a few? Um, the short answer is I, I did say that. 
I expect the players will have a lot of suggestions and proposals that we'll offer to the owners for, for their consideration and discussion. Hopefully we'll get uh, agreement on those kinds of things. But the answer to your second question is no. I think we owe it to the process first to discuss those matters with the rest of the players who were not here, and secondly, to broach them across the table. It's uh, been known that the talks uh, will start soon. What do you expect uh, in the first uh, few meetings, uh, Don? Well, I, I don't know for certain, okay? And um, I don't want to try and predict in that regard. But what I would anticipate could happen, and I emphasize could, is that um, the parties will sit down and discuss issues that, that they have which give them some concerns or in which they'd like to see some modifications, and perhaps at the early stages, perhaps not suggesting what those modifications would be. One of the things which typically happens in, in collective bargaining situations, not always, but which typically happens is that the parties endeavor to try and come to a common understanding of what the facts are. And that doesn't always give you a common understanding of what you should do about those facts, but it always helps to, to not have disagreements as to what the situation is. And it's certainly conceivable that we'll spend uh, uh, some time doing that. Having said that, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And whenever you get into a bargaining situation like this, what you hope to do is come up with a comfortable method of having the exchange of views and proposals and questions and information and discussion that everybody can live with. And you know, that has to take pro uh, place at the table. We're going to take a call from the conference call. Thank you. Our first question on the phone comes from Kevin McGran with Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Uh, Donald, um, wh where do the players stand on the, uh, on the existence of a salary cap? Is that a fact of life for them now, or is that something that you'd uh, like to see eliminated this go around? Well, two things. It is a fact of life for them now. It has been since uh, the lockout ended and the agreement was reached. Um, I'm not going to say anything at this point about what the proposals would be for the reasons that I previously indicated. Um, I think it'll be pretty clear pretty early on where the parties stand on that, certainly where the players are, but um, it needs to be done at the table first. Thank you. Take another one from the conference call. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Ken Campbell with the Hockey News. Please go ahead. Hi, Don. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Don, you were quoted as saying the other day that September 15th is not a, I believe you used the words magic date. And I, I just wanted to get it, uh, to get it clear uh, in my mind. Uh, does that mean that um, the players uh, and the Players Association would be willing to start next season without a collective bargaining agreement in place and was that something that was discussed in these meetings is that is that going to be a, a, a tenant going forward like are, are are the players willing to start next year without a collective bargaining agreement in place well, let me go uh, answer your questions in reverse um, first of all the players haven't considered uh, what they would do on September 15th or any other date if no agreement's in place. Our hope is that that's not going to be anything that we have to worry about. So that's the first thing. Secondly, in terms of the question that I answered, I was trying to explain how the law works. And essentially it is this, that um, when a contract expires, if there is no new agreement and if the parties are willing to continue negotiating, to try and get it, you continue to work under the terms of the old agreement um, until somebody is no longer willing to do that. And so in response to a question which was basically like, will there necessarily be a, um, a work stoppage on September the 15th or a lockout if there's no agreement, the answer is that's not required by anything. That's a matter mm -hmm. of a decision that one side or the other makes. Let's take a question from the web. We have a question here from Nick Katanika from Yahoo Sports. Don, where are the main potential points of compromise? Are the players willing to take less of the revenue if the owners are willing to share more of it? Well, un unfortunately, Nick, I think you know that I'm going to tell you I can't answer that question right now. Um, we'll have to get into it um, at bargaining. We'll have to see what the positions of the parties are. That's a, 
vastly premature question um, at this stage of the events. Um, more appropriately asked down the road a bit, uh, perhaps weeks from now, uh, once we know what the positions of the parties are and we see what the situation is. We'll take a question from the conference call. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lance Hornby with Toronto Sun. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Don. Can you uh, take a, a talk a little bit about uh, the, your constituency there? Uh, some of them, obviously, uh, you don't know. A couple of them in that room have probably been through this before. What's your opinion on how uh, how savvy these guys are about uh, the CBA and uh, you know and some of the uh, issues going forward? Well, they're they're all standing here, so you know I'm going to have to say it's pretty good anyway. <laughs> but. I have been asked repeatedly, you know, over the course of the last two years, after spending 33 years in baseball, why in the world did you take this job with all the headaches that prior executive directors in the last uh, few years have had in the NHLPA? And I always said that there were two reasons, because there really are only two, and the first one is vastly more important than the second one. And that is that after working with the guys to help put the organization back together, um, during the period in which they did not have an executive director. I came to know a large number of them. I came to spend a lot of time working with them. I came to talk to an awful lot uh, more players whom I didn't know personally, to participate in some of their conference calls, and to have some meetings with them. And what came out of that is I really like them. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And if there's any question that anybody has, that for some reason they can't or won't pick up what they need to know, that the issues are too complex or anything like that, I, I just treat that as simple nonsense. They get it, they get it easily, they get it the first time, and they're on, on top of the game. And I'm fully confident and uh, prepared to go into this negotiation uh, working for this group of people. Thank you. Tom, back to uh, September 15th. If, almost by definition, you have to keep talking at some point if a deal's not reached, why isn't that assumed that you would open camps and play under the old agreement, if you understand that? That's not a question that, that uh, would be addressed to me. I wasn't here the last time when the owners made a decision not to do that, nor was I here when, when that happened some 10 years before the last time. Um, I don't know what their view is. I'm hoping that's not something that they will have to face or we will have to face. Um, and we just have to see uh, what develops um, when it gets there. I can tell you that in my prior existence, there were any number of periods in which uh, uh, the season continued when there was no formal agreement in place. Don, with uh, respect to the last time, Yes. And mindful of obvious confidentiality throughout the process, how important is it to, to you and, and to the players to educate and inform the fans throughout the process whenever you can? Um, to the extent that that can be done in a timeful and in a manner which is, which is complete, uh, obviously you want to try and do that. Um, but in terms of educating and informing, the people that I most want to make sure are educated and informed are the people standing behind me and their colleagues. That, that group of 725 or a bit more um, is the key. So we'll be doing both. Having said that, you know, there is something that happens sometimes in bargaining, which is that you get busy actually bargaining. And then there is a lot less time to answer questions from members of the media, and sometimes that gets in the way. All I can tell you is we'll do the best we can uh, as we go forward. Let's take a question from the conference call. Thank you. Our next question comes from Liz Mullen with Sports Business Journal. Please go ahead. Hi, Don. Hi there. Um, I guess I want to ask you, there, there has been speculation in the media and in the industry um, that the NHL owners may seek some kind of economic rollback from the players, perhaps a greater share of the NHL revenues. In your experience, um, it, when the owners are seeking, um, it, are making economic demands of some sort of the players, wouldn't you know it by now? Is it, you know, if in your experience in collective bargaining, if either side is seeking a major change, don't they sort of tell you that um, 
I don't know, many more months in advance than you have now before the expiration of, of the collective bargaining agreement? The, the answer is sometimes that indeed does happen, but it doesn't happen all the time. And this is one of those times in which, you know, that hasn't happened. So uh, we'll just have to wait and see. It, it's not concerning to me that we don't, don't have advance notice of uh, all the positions that the owners are, are going to put forward in the, in the bargaining. Sometimes things happen one way, sometimes times they happen another way. John, I know that you've said that it'll be a rotating group of players involved in the negotiations. Has it already been determined how many players will be involved in the first meeting with the NHL, and if so, how many? Uh, not precisely, but it'll, it'll be quite a few, probably less than 10 at that meeting. And when you say rotating, or if I've previously used that word, I don't mean that to suggest that there'll be a group, group A comes in on Monday and group B comes in on Wednesday or anything like that. What I mean is that I expect there's going to be lots of meetings and that I expect significant numbers of players to attend one or more meetings. Obviously, some will come a lot more frequently than others, so it won't be the same cast of characters. Donald, um, over here, sorry. I know you weren't here last time, and I hope this is a fair question, but talking to some of these guys the last couple of days, they said the last time around the owners categorically almost won every point they wanted, and these guys, the, the players, didn't get as much as they wanted. Is it fair? Can you, can you see a, uh, foresee that happening this time? Look, all I can say about that, um, well, I can say two things about that. The first one is the players understand what happened last time. Of course they do. A bunch of them lived through it, and f with respect to those that didn't, they've been told by the guys that did. So they understand that backdrop. They understand what took place. Um, every agreement that you make, however, stands on its own, and you have to go forward. And you don't start the negotiations by announcing that, you know, you'd like a less favorable arrangement. Let's take a question from the webcast. We have a question here from Jason Brow from NBCSports.com. Don, what do you make of all the good news coming out of the league offices with regards to revenues? Do you see this as an opportunity for the players to win back some of what they gave up in the last negotiations? Well, I'm not going to get into the second part of the question, but with respect to the first part, obviously more revenues, record revenues, a growing business, a greater appeal of uh, hockey, higher television ratings, all those things are good news. And anybody that's in, in large or small part responsible for doing that deserves to be thanked and congratulated. That obviously includes the players and it obviously includes the people on the management side. Let's take another one from the webcast. We have a question here from Tim Panaccio from CSNPhilly.com. Don, is there one issue that the players have identified as their top priority? I don't discuss internal meetings with players. You'll have to wait on things like that. Sorry. Take a call from the conference call. Thank you. We do have a follow-up question from Ken Campbell with the Hockey News. Please go ahead. Yeah, Donna, a uh, two-parter if you'll uh, indulge me. First of all, I'm wondering um, what the level of involvement will be from the players uh, this time around in terms of the actual bargaining. And, and secondly, um, as a follow-up question, I'm wondering if uh, the plight of some of the um, uh, franchises that uh, appear to be habitually losing money, the Phoenixes and, and others, and, and the possibility of them, uh, them moving and, and, and sort of the, the rationale uh, reasons for them moving is going to become part of this, this process, do you think, from, I, from, your, si from your side? I, I have no way to know whether the second issue um, would arise at, at all at this stage. I hope it doesn't. Because if it does, that would suggest there were some uh, issues that it had to be dealt with, which, which might be a little tough. But we'll wait and see on that. You know, um, the commissioner has indicated repeatedly publicly that he hopes and expects matters are going to be worked out in Phoenix, and I hope he's right. That'll put that issue by, uh, you know, behind us if indeed that uh, takes place. Um, with respect to the first one, the level of involvement, you know, with the players. I expect it to be very large and very significant and constant. Um, as far as I'm concerned, any player that wants to come to meetings, all he has to do is show up, and if he needs an airline ticket and a hotel room, the union will pay for it. Um, it's their futures. They need to take responsibility for it, and I'm absolutely persuaded that they are ready, willing, and able to do that, as they should be. We'll take a call from the web, or question from the web, sorry. 
Don, uh, we have another question here from David Schultz of the Globe and Mail. It seems clear the owners want the players to cut their share of HRR from 57% to 50% or less. What kind of cut is the PA prepared to accept? <laughs> I, I think we're getting into the repetition phase, but maybe the questions were all sent in, they're all sent in at once. Uh, I, I can say two things about that. I'm not going to get into the, the, the specifics of uh, how we might react to hypothetical proposals. If it comes, we'll react to it, we'll discuss it internally what it is, we'll ask the reasons and, and all that kind of stuff, um, as you might expect. Um, but it's premature to go past that at this stage. We have another one here from the web, from Jean-Francois Jean Chabot. Don, which are the main issues leading to the renewal of the agreement? Um, the, the main issue is getting an agreement on all the various parts that people are going to have disagreements about if it turns out we have disagreements. Um, look, uh, those are things that for the reasons I've previously expressed, I'm not prepared to get into today. Um, sometimes you get into bargaining and you say, oh, wow, all my predictions about what the other side was going to say turned out to be right. And sometimes you get into bargaining and you find out that they didn't advance some of those things and they advanced some others and maybe they said some things that make you even less happy or maybe they said some things which say, look, there's a way to try and, and get an agreement and an understanding here. And predicting ahead of time and making comments ahead of time in a vacuum is, has the potential of being really counterproductive and I just don't want to do it. That you, you do not want to, to unnecessarily complicate a process. You know, you want to make it as simple as, and clean as possible. If it's going to get complicated, it'll happen because there's a reason to. Uh, Don, just quickly getting back to, uh, you know, the record revenues being a, a good thing, obviously. Is, is that something you, you kind of have to be mindful of, it maybe in the back of your mind when you go into a negotiations that you don't want to, you know, damage that in any way? Or, or is that, you just have to kind of block that out? I guess the best way to respond to that is this. First of all, you want to know what the economic condition of the industry is. And when things are going better and you, you're having years of record revenues, especially, and I think Gary mentioned this at his, at his press conference, that this has happened during some periods of generally difficult economic times in North America, that obviously that's good, obviously you notice it, obviously that forms a part of, and perhaps a significant part of the background facts under which you uh, are pursuant to which you undertake the negotiations. Um, so you can't black it out, and you shouldn't black it out, but whether that item standing in isolation becomes something which is really important for the discussions you end up ha having is something that you can't know till you get there. But obviously it's there, it's real. Look, if revenues were flat at the level that they were in 2004, everybody in this room and listening on the phone and on the web would understand that we would be likely having different discussions than, than since they've gone up 65 percent. Donald, how important, this may seem very oversimplistic, but how important is it for there to be a sense of trust when you're entering collective bargaining agreement? Because with what happened the last time, one would think that there's probably a sense of distrust. I look at it this way. From my standpoint, there's two senses of trust that has to be developed. The first one is among the players and the staff for and with one another. You gotta get that right. And that, is in large part, is why I've been spending so much time the last year and a half making sure the players um, know me and that I know them and that we speak the same language and we don't misunderstand one another and, and all the rest of it. Secondly, you know, um, over time, relationships develop. This relationship in terms of the particular marrying of personalities involved, in this case, me on one side and Gary on the other side, um, is something that ha has to develop over time. You would hope that there would be great trust and you would hope that that would f flow from developing a common understanding of what the background facts are. You know, Gary's a pro, I'm a pro, we've been doing this a long time. I'm hopeful that won't be an issue. Let's take three more from the web before we conclude. We have one here from Jesse Spector of the Sporting News. Don, when you meet with management, do you expect to make a proposal or receive one? 
Or is the first meeting just to set the groundwork? I don't want to comment on what I expect to have happen at the first meeting. We'll wait and see, um, obviously, how it develops. I, I will say to you that I'm not sure, sure it matters one way or another. We have another one here from uh, David Schultz of the Global Mail. Don, what are the players who are around for the 2004-05 talks telling you about the mood between the union and the league now compared to then? Um, as I've said before and will undoubtedly say a number of other times over the course of the next several weeks, I don't discuss conversations I have with players other than with players. And so you'll just have to understand that. Um, the players that I speak to are certainly free to talk to you or anybody else that they want to about that. Um, we don't have any rules or suggestion of rules inhibiting any of such discussion, but you'll have to address it to them. I work for them, not the other way around. We have another one here from Larry Brooks of the New York Post. Don, has the 5% escalator been adopted for this season? Um, we have resolved that issue uh, with the league, and there'll be an announcement on that, I believe, later today, jointly. Thanks for everyone's time. We will do some one-on-ones with those in attendance with the guys here. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen on the phone, this now ends the conference. Have a good day. Thank you.